Uh, welcome to the first of four sessions. I uh, hope you all had a good Dean's date or whatever you can make of that statement. I have learnt better than to try to schedule review sessions the evening of Dean's date. Made that mistake about the first four years and never again. It's a very nice small class when I do, I guess. But uh, anyway, so here is my plan. And it is a little bit different based on the pre-midterm review, which of course was a bit of a marathon session. I, you know, I tend to go and do a complete review of the post-midterm material and then uh, and illustrate a lot of what I say with examples. And the problem is the examples take a long time. And I, I think there's quite a lot of problems that are in the final exams which haven't been solved. I think three out of the eight had no solutions provided, one of which was extremely difficult, mm -hmm. as I recall. Um, and then even the, some of them that do have solutions, the solutions are sort of so lack of, they have such a lack of detail that they're sort of useless if you don't know how to do the problem. So uh, I'm leaving quite a lot of time, I hope, for Q&A. That's the point. So maybe I'd, I'd give a few, uh, a few less, ex well, a bit fewer examples is what I'm trying to say uh, along the way and then leave more time at the, leave more time for questions in general. So that's my plan. On the other hand, I have tried to boil down all of the course post midterm into really a, a few topics and subtopics thereof. And so what I'd like to do is present to you over today and then tomorrow, uh, which I believe is in Frist 302. If I'm not mistaken, that's the one that's in a different location. Is, is, that, is that correct? That's what, yeah. And then the next week we have two more that are in this room. And I'll just be finishing off this presentation and whatever time is left over is for questions. And of course, you're welcome to ask uh, individual questions along the way. All right, so that's the plan of attack. Uh, these are two and a half hour sessions, so I, I'd like to take a five minute break in the middle uh, sometime. So I'll, I'm gonna try to, to uh, maintain that and then you can change the tapes at the time as well. All right, so before I launch in, in uh, are there any, there any sort of general questions that someone has that, that any of you have sort of burning, the burning need to have answered? Yes. Can we do a lot of true false? <laughs> we can do a lot of true false. Um, I would like to save them for the Q&A, but I want to say as an open invitation that if you think there's a problem that pertains to what I've been talking about, what, what, you know, wherever I am in this review. If it seems like there's a problem that, that it, it, it pertains to that, true, false, or otherwise, that is a good time to ask it as well. And that way you don't have to work, wait for the Q&A, and I think that's a beneficial thing. If I don't think it's relevant, we can postpone it until it is. Um, you know, that, that I'll be able to hopefully say, oh, no, no, that's not about this. Uh, but we should come back to it when we do this, okay? So, uh, yes, true, false, definitely. And, and the Q&A, you know, anything is fair game. So we'll definitely do some of that. Another question. Symmetric. Yes, I'll be talking all, all about symmetric matrices versus regular diagonalization as part of the review. Probably not, I mean, not tonight. I won't be getting up to it. But uh, of course, you can come to me afterwards and, and ask me these burning questions. But I, I'll definitely be talking about that. Um, any other sort of general things that anyone has on their mind before I commence? I, I mean, as I said in the email, the pre midterm stuff, I did a thorough sort of review of that. Uh, and you, the, it was, it's on the video, so you can look at that. Of course, the questions in the Q&A, the whole course is fair game. Any final midterm homework problem, quiz problem from any previous uh, or, or, or ones that you did, of course, you won't have this current final, but uh, you have the quizzes in the midterm. Any of that is, is fair game uh, for the Q&A. Any other questions? All right. Well, let's begin. Let me give you the glorious overview by which I think there's three big topics which kind of look, look uh, a little bunged together. But topic one I'm going to consider as transposes, 
orthogonal stuff. And least squares. Two is going to be determinants. And three is eigenvalue stuff. So this is the biggest of the three topics. This one really is only, say, 5.3 and 4, pretty much. This one is chapter 6. And this is chapters 7 through 9, vaguely speaking. But I think logically it makes sense to have that sort of division in mind. And of course, there are subtopics within these things. OK, so I will start with one, of course. And so one transposes orthogonal stuff least squares. You can write that out again, but I'm not going to. And of course, I'm going to start with transposes. So my idea here is that I kind of want to collect all the facts that I can think of about transposes so that you can sort of have them in one place. And they don't all come from the same place in the textbook. So, so these are sort of, I mean, as I say, it's mostly in 5.3 and 5.4. But the, these are the main facts that I feel you should know about transposes. So first of all, you should know what the definition is and how to compute it. And the way I think of it is that columns become rows. So when I'm writing down a transpose of this, all I do is I take that column and I make it the row. And then I take that second column and make it the second row. OK, so I mean, that's a simple little example, but it, it really shows the idea. So you should be sufficiently adept with transposes that you can more or less just write down the transpose of something. And you've got to be a little careful sometimes when there's lots of like zeros and ones and minus ones. You know, it can be, it can be tricky. So just, just pay care when you write down a transpose. OK. Again, if, if you have any questions along the way, please, please do call out. Um, all right. Now, it might be worth noting that the image of A transpose is the row space of A. So this is something that's not dwelt on, but I've seen it referred to quite a bit in previous problems of final. So the row space of A, you might see that. So what is that? Well, if you have a matrix like this, 1, 5, 6, 8, 2, minus 3, the row space, by definition, is the span of the rows if you consider them as vectors. I don't know. I mean, I, I, will, I will transfer them into column vectors, whether or not you think of them as row vectors or col column vectors. The idea is that you take the rows and treat them as just vectors and, and, and look at their span. And that's the definition of the row space. But of course, that is exactly the image of the above matrix, as in this matrix. Because the image is the span of the columns of a matrix. So you could get by without ever talking about a row space if you just understand that's the same as the column space, as in image, of the transpose of a matrix. OK, so it, I don't think we really covered this. But then I, I noticed as I was looking it is mentioned in the textbook, but I noticed as I was looking at previous pro, uh, finals that they will occasionally talk about the row space. So if you ever see that, just think of it as the image of the transpose. That's the easiest way to deal with it. All right. Very important fact. If you have a product of two matrices, and remember, these don't need to be square. They don't even need to be the same dimension. But you do need the number of columns of A to be the same as the number of rows of, of B. Okay. So, so if that makes sense, then you can take its transpose, and it turns out that this is B transpose, A transpose. And that's the same relationship as the inverse. This is sort of 
we have this as well. AB inverse is B inverse A inverse. But this is a much more restrictive equation because this is only true if A and B are square, the same size, and both invertible. Otherwise, it, this doesn't even make sense. You can't have an invertible matrix that isn't square. So I didn't really need to say square here, but I wanted to emphasize that for this equation to make sense, A and B both have to be invertible n by n matrices. If A is not invertible, then what the hell is A inverse anyway? It doesn't exist. But this equation here is quite general. It applies to any rectangular matrices, invertible or whatever. This is very general. All that has to happen is that AB has to make sense. So this is for almost any pair of matrices for any uh, A, which would be, say, M by P and B, P by N, say. Okay, so not even necessarily square. So it's a pretty useful generalized thing. On the other hand, if A is, is invertible, if A is invertible, obviously means square, of course, then so is the transpose. And we have the relationship that the inverse of A transpose is exactly what you'd hope it would be. It's the transpose of A inverse. Okay, honestly, although that's a fact that I think you should be aware of, I can't think of too many problems. Maybe there is a one or two true or false problems that might rely on that. But the other one, the AB transpose, I've seen plenty of problems that rely on that. Okay, so that's a, it could be useful. All right, so symmetric, or asymmetric, A, not asymmetric, but A, the matrix being symmetric means A transpose equals A. And as, although when you first define, we defined this, it just seemed like a curiosity. So what? It's symmetric. Actually, there was something quite important about it. Namely, there's the spectral theorem. And that's exactly what it applies to these sorts of matrices. But I'm not going to talk about that just yet. That will be in the third section involving eigenvalues. All right, so that's important to at least know what symmetric means. Uh, A uh, symmetric. This comes up less often, but this time it means if you take the transpose, you get minus A instead. So in particular, it's worth sort of looking at what this means, that for this sort of matrix, the diagonal elements must be 0. So otherwise, when you took the transpose, see the diagonal elements of a square matrix stay the same when you take the transpose. And so if you want every transposed element to be the same as the negative of that, minus itself is 0. So you must have something like 0, 0, 0. But if you knew what the numbers up here were, then to make this into a skew symmetric matrix, you just sort of copy across the diagonal and put a minus sign. So this one is an example of a skew symmetric matrix. Okay, so it comes up from time to time. But symmetric is really what comes up a lot. Okay, so here's some other facts. This one is really important. If you have two vectors, V and W, V dot W is V transpose W. Not with a dot in the middle. This is a product of two matrices. Actually, when you multiply two matrices, one of which has one row and the other one has one column, 
you will get a one by one matrix that'll be a one by one matrix mm -hmm. one times five, 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 five plus three times minus one plus minus two times four. That's just the dot product. Five minus three is two, minus eight is negative six. And it's actually technically embedded in a one by one matrix, but there's no difference between a one by one matrix and a number. So we, we identify one by one matrices with just the number itself. Okay, so um, this is important because it allows you to use in particular this relationship here. And so you can turn dot products into transposes and then you can, it's sort of easy to deal with matrices so if you have instead a v dot w, then, well, here's an example of, of this application. If you were to take, say, a v dot w, or let's do this, v dot a w. No, I'll take it back. I'll do a v dot w. So this is the vector a v dot the vector w. And so by what I've said, this is AV transpose W. Not with the dot, that's just applying this. Now let's apply this rule and get V transpose A transpose W. Okay, so that rule is that you reverse the order of the A and the V and then put the transpose. And now let's think of this as V transpose matrix product with A transpose W. And then by reversing this rule, but with W replaced by A transpose W, which is this, you get that this is the dot product of V and A transpose W. And so actually, this gives you another rule, which is not emphasized in this course, but which is really quite important and might come in handy, that a v dot w is equal to v dot a transpose w. And so I say that the table text doesn't make a little more of that fact, because it's really the definition of transpose as a linear transformation. As a linear transformation, you're looking, you're given a transformation a, say, or t, whatever you want to call it, that that changes V somehow. And you want to know, well, if you left V the same, but changed W, how could you get the dot product the same? And that's this A transpose. That's a different linear transformation. And in matrix form, it happens to be the flip of it. But this is sort of a more, it's a more geometrical approach. Anyway, this one is actually more important. But that one could come in handy too. And I've done a couple of true or false questions by using that fact. All right. A few more facts about transposes. It is a fact that you might want to use that the rank of A is the same as the rank of A transpose. Actually, I'll write it as the rank of A transpose is the same as the rank of A. And that's not an obvious thing. Because the rank of A transpose is the dimension of the row space, as I've said earlier on, and the rank of A is the dimension of the column space. And it turns out that they're the same, but it's sort of not obvious. You know, it needs a proof. But you're allowed to quote it. Here is something else that I've seen. Okay. So suppose that A is n by m. And remember, just that means that it takes an n-dimensional vector and gives you an n-dimensional vector. That's the slightly counterintuitive uh, ordering of the thing, but that's how it works. Um, now, if you take the image of A, and I just want you to, that's a subspace of Rn. The kernel's within Rm, but the image is within Rn. And so, on the other hand, A is m by n, so it maps Rn to Rm. So the kernel of A transpose 
everything is backwards because you're dealing with the transpose. It's actually a subset of Rn, not Rm. So both of these sets, Ma and the kernel of A transpose, live in Rn. And the relationship is that they're completely orthogonal to each other. So in some sense, in the image of A is orthogonal to the kernel of A transpose. Or in other words, the actual equation is that the image of A, that subspace perp, the, the orthogonal complement, the perpendicular subspace, is equal to the kernel of A transpose. And that's a fact that is listed in the book and that, once again, I think it's more common in true-false questions that that has come up. But it's sort of important when you see an equation like that just to take a little step back and say, well, where do these things live? And the answer is they're both subspaces of Rn. Question. You can state that rank A transposes rank A if you need it. That's, that's a fact that's in the textbook that you're allowed to quote. The, I mean, the proving it is, is you have to do a bit of work, and, and we wouldn't expect that on the exam. There's no indication of that sort of level of, of proof required. On the other hand, I have seen some, some problems that relied on it, and I've seen some problems that rely on that, that uh, bottom fact with the box around it as well. Okay, now, that fact you actually use when you try to compute the orthogonal subspace of, of, of the image. Um, so, you know, we, we've actually an we, we've applied this pre-midterm, believe it or not. Um, I'll show you what I'm talking about in a sec. I'm not going to work the whole example, but I'll just, because especially since it's pre midterm, but just as a sort of reminder, is that, and bless you, I'm trying to make this last equation make a little bit more sense. If I give you two vectors, say in R5, V1 equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, say, and V2 equals 2, 3, 1, 0, minus 1. And the question is, so let V, well, actually, I'll give you a V3. What the hell? 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. I hope those are linearly independent. Uh, let V be the span of these three vectors. Find V perp. Find a basis. For v perp. Okay, this is computationally probably going to be disgusting, and I'm not going to work it out, but I will show you the methodology. You may recall the solution is to write down these vectors as row vectors and then find the kernel of that. So let's see how that makes exactly sense uh, given what is in that box over there. So let A actually be v1, v2, v3 as columns. Okay, let that be the case. And V is actually the image of A. It doesn't even matter if they're independent, actually, as it turns out. Let V be the image, uh, V is then the image of A, because remember, the span of a bunch of vectors is the same as the image of a matrix whose columns are made up of those vectors. All right, so V is an image of A. V perp is the image of A perp which by that box statement is the same thing as the kernel of A transpose. So all we need to do, so in our case, A is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 2, 3, 1, 0, minus 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. And so V perp is the kernel of A transpose, which is the kernel of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, written as a row, 2, 3, 1, 0, minus 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. Okay, so we knew the technique, and now let's see why it just makes total sense. 
Let's see why it makes total sense. Suppose we find a vector in this kernel. So here's a five-dimensional vector, A, B, C, D, E, which is in this kernel. That means when you multiply this matrix with this vector, you get 0. Now, if you think about what the multiplication does, if you actually multiply this by this, by this vector, this is, this is just rough here. I, I, this is the actual thing, but I just am drawing a ghostly A, B, C, D, E. It's not really there. Uh, I, I just want you to mentally multiply this matrix by this vector. What you get in the first ghostly entry is the dot product of this with this. And that's supposed to be 0 because it's in the kernel. And the dot product of this with this, which is 0. And the dot product of this with this, which is 0 because it's in the kernel. And so basically, this vector is orthogonal to these three vectors, meaning that it's perpendicular to the subspace. Because the subspace is spanned by these vectors, so any combination of those vectors will also be orthogonal. So that's why it makes sense. I just, you know, when you see an, a confusing looking equation like this, it, it really helps to bring it back down to an example where, even though I haven't actually worked out the example, you I hope you can see why it makes sense. All right, any questions about that before I go on? Okay. Oh yeah, no, you can certainly cite this fact here. But I, I mean, again, I hope, so that I think that one is easier to see why it's true than the top one. The top one you have to get a little clever. And I, I'm not going to do it now, although I did think, I think I did it in the actual uh, weekly reviews. All right, just a couple more things about transposers. And I'd like to move on to orthogonal stuff. So let's see. What else about transposers? Another fact from the same sort of, along the same lines, um, we saw that the kernel of A is equal to the kernel of A transpose A. OK, that's a fact. Again, I mean, the proof of it is not that tricky, but it, you have to be a little clever. So this is something you can quote if you need it. Now, the reason we needed it, just to put this in perspective of why such a thing might actually be useful, is this. A need not be square. So A transpose could be meaningless. If A is not square, A, A, I'm sorry, A inverse might be meaning, meaningless. If A is not square, there's no such thing as A inverse. It's, it's, it just doesn't exist. On the other hand, even so, A transpose A is always square. Just by consideration of dimensions. If A is n by m, and A transpose is therefore n, m by n, then the product of A transpose with A is a square m by m matrix. And in fact, it's symmetric. And as an aside, I'll give you a proof of that, because I think that's simple enough that you might conceivably be asked to do it. I claim A transpose A is symmetric, and the way I'm going to prove it is by taking its transpose and showing that it's the same as the original. This, of course, is A transpose times A transpose transpose. I've reversed the order of these two and then taking the transpose. So you get A transpose times A transpose transpose. And I guess I didn't state it because it was so obvious, but the transpose of the transpose is the original. So this is A transpose A. So this matrix, which is square, has a transpose which is equal to itself. So it's symmetric. That's the proof. It's, it's really a very short proof. OK, so basically, this may be invertible. And so the, the, this becomes useful by saying, if kernel of A itself is 0, as in just the zero vector, 
columns of A are linearly independent. These are all equivalent things. Then according to this equation above, the kernel of A transpose A equals 0 as well, because the two kernels are equal. Therefore, A transpose A is invertible. Okay, so the logical thing is kernel of A is 0. You'd like to say, oh, A is invertible. Wait, A is not even square. Ah, but A transpose A is square. It, it is invertible. And that came in handy for least squares, etc. Least squares. And also volumes, it comes up there. Okay, so again, this was introduced in the book as a sort of ancillary fact that you needed to deal with the least squares stuff. But, of course, it can be used in true-false questions or other sort of proofy type of questions without least squares. Um, and, and apparently we have no shame in or qualms about doing that, even though the book kind of says, oh, well, you just need this. I mean, they prove it, but they don't say this is a beautiful fact on itself. Well, somehow we want you to know it, just judging by the previous exams. All right, I only have one other thing I want to say about transposes, which is this. I want to tell you something about A transpose A. If A is V1 up to Vm, so it's N by m as usual, then A transpose A is explicitly, you can write down, by the way, A transpose. Well, let's just compute it. Actually, I don't want to compute it. I'll just tell you what it is. It's very easy to compute it. It's V1 dot V1, V1 dot V2, and so on. V1 dot Vm. That's the first row. M of them. The second row is V1 dot V2. Again, V2 dot V2. V3 dot V2, or depending on which order you want to say it in. So I want to write the V2 first. So perhaps I should do that here as well. Maybe I should do that here. But of course, this is the same as this. So that emphasizes the symmetric nature. And so on until Vm dot V1, which I should point out is the same as this one up here, V1 dot Vm. This will be Vm dot V2. And so on until Vm dot Vm. Now, although you could compute this, it kind of seems worthwhile to be aware of it, especially when I saw one question in a previous final which asked a question about this sort of matrix precisely. And the solution kind of relies on you realizing that that's the same as A transpose A, where A is this matrix. So, although I've presented it as here's A, that's what A transpose A is if you compute it. The problem that I was really concerned about is when they gave you this and expected you to recognize that that was A transpose A. So it's sort of backwards thing, which I consider to be harder. Okay, so that's my little clinic about transposes and everything I could think of that seemed relevant. Not particularly beautiful or interesting actually, but pretty useful, I hope. Here's what I think you ought to know about orthogonal matrices as opposed to symmetric matrices. Okay, so there are a bunch of equivalent conditions, any of which means or is equivalent to e each other. So essentially, here are equivalent properties for an n by n matrix A. So we're dealing with a square matrix now. Something crackling. Very odd. Ah, it's the bottom of the board. Okay. 
So A is orthogonal. All right, that's just the name. What does it mean? Well, take your pick. It means any of these following things. The length of AX is equal to the length of X for all X, all vectors X in Rn. So A is length preserving. What you started with is x. You hit it with a, you get something new, ax. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the same length as x, but if it's orthogonal, then it does. Also, you have ax dot ay is equal to x dot y for all x and y in Rn, i.e. A preserves dot products, or in a more sophisticated interpretation, it preserves angles. Dot products really relate to angles between vectors, right? A, a B, cosine, theta sort of thing. So what I'm saying is if you have an orthogonal transformation, and you have two vectors with a certain angle between them, and you hit them with both with A, the new vectors not only have the same length, but they, there's actually there's the same angle between them. So orthogonal matrices, are, they're pretty respectful, actually, when it comes to vectors. They, they, they can rotate them around or reflect them, but that's pretty much it. They don't, they don't like to interfere too much. That's the way I think of them anyway. Very polite. Very polite, these orthogonal matrices. They just, they just don't like to rock the boat. All right. There's some more. There's still more. Here is D continuing on the list. OK. If you take the vectors A, E1, and remember E1 is the vector with a 1 in the first place and zeros everywhere else. And then you do the same with E2, which has the 1 in the second place, all the way up to A, E, N. And you consider these vectors. Of course, in general, you can't say much about them. They are actually the columns of the matrix, but more on that in a second. Uh, these actually form an orthonormal basis. Of Rn. OK, so if that's true, then A is orthogonal, and vice versa. If A is orthogonal, then that is true. OK, so what, why does that make sense? Well, based on what I've said, OK, so here's a, here's a standard orthonormal basis, x, y, z. OK, so what I've just said in the previous two is that not only the lengths are preserved, but the angles are preserved. So that means that if you look where this one goes, and this one, and this one, well, they still all have length 1. OK, my thumb is not quite as long, but just pretend. Um, they still all have length 1, and they're still orthogonal to each other. So they get rotated somehow, or maybe even reflected. Just ignore my other two fingers. But essentially, they're still an orthonormal basis. OK? Now, if you then interpret this as the columns of the matrix A, then quite obviously, the columns of A are an orthonormal basis. That's not saying anything a little bit even different to D, but it just is a, saying it in a different way. The columns are the rows. Well, I say the columns, but I also say that actually the rows also of A <laughs> are an orthonormal basis. Rn. That is also good enough. Why? Well, it's because the following. Well, it's not, I, I will come back to why that's true. But it's not too bad. Now, another characterization that is equally equivalent to any of these things 
is that the inverse of A exists. So if A is orthogonal, then its inverse exists. And that's pretty easy to see. After all, its columns are an orthonormal basis. So of course, they're linearly linear independent. Linear independent. Yep. And where the matrix whose columns are linearly independent, its kernel is 0, its image is all of Rn, and in particular, it's invertible. So this exists, and here is the really crucial relationship. The inverse of A is actually its transpose. Orthogonal matrices, it's really easy to invert. You don't have to do any work. You just have to transpose. Of course, you have to know it's orthogonal for that to make sense, but that's the case. And one way you can see it very easily is actually through this. If the columns of A, let's say it's m by m, because I've, so let's say th these are all m vectors, just to make things a little cleaner. If these columns are an orthonormal basis, then v1 dot v1 is 1, as is v2 dot v2, all the way down to vn dot vm. But all the others are 0, v1 dot v2. Actually, that matrix becomes the identity. Uh, in other words, A transpose A is the identity, which is exactly what I got out of that matrix. And similarly, if you prefer, A, A transpose will also be the identity, because matrices are cool like that. A, B is the identity, so is B, A. And then they're both inverses of each other. Provided that they're square, if they're rectangular, as you know from all those true-false questions, then if that's not true. But I'm assuming here in this entire context that A is square. Yeah, a question. Uh, can you say anything about the sum of the values from the rows or columns of A? The sum of the values of the rows or columns? Yeah. What do you mean by the sum of the values? You mean if you add up the, the rows? If you add up the entries in a row, do they add something? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. The question is, if you add up the entries in a row, do they add up to something? If you add up the squares of the entries in a row, they add up to 1. And that implies it's an orthonormal basis. But I don't think you get anything in general special about adding up the rows. But if, it's square, if you square the entries of the row... If you, if you take the entries along a row and square them, that gives you the length of the row vector, say. Squared. But the length is 1, because the row vectors form an orthonormal basis. Okay? So I can immediately say, for example, that this matrix is not orthonormal, without even looking at it, because that squared plus that squared is not 1. That squared plus that squared is not 1. That dot that is not 1. Or you can do the same thing for, for columns, for, for rows, rather. Okay? All right. Um, so these are the characterizations of orthonormal matrices, however you want to define them. You can actually define them any of these ways. And one of them leads to all the others. Yeah, in this whole context of part B, orthogonal matrices, A has to be square. There's no such thing as an orthogonal matrix that's not square, or, or even an orthogonal transformation that's not linear. I mean, as far as we're concerned, all of these, there's one true false question or something that asks, oh, if you have any function, you know, okay, I don't know what you call it, but we're, for us, orthogonal has to be linear. Okay? Um, now, here is, okay, so these are not facts. These are all equivalent facts about orthogonal matrices. But now I want to show you some other facts that don't necessarily imply that a matrix is orthogonal, but, but these are useful. If A is orthogonal, then so is A inverse, i.e. so is A transpose, because we've just decided that if A is orthogonal, then A inverse is the same thing as A transpose. So if A is orthogonal, so is A transpose. And that's how you get the rows. If you knew the columns are an orthonormal basis, how do you know that the rows are also an orthonormal basis? Well, the rows are the same as the columns of A transpose. So the columns of this are an orthonormal basis. So the rows of this are. You get that for free. 
So if you were skeptical about it, F, well, that's how you prove it. Also, if A and B are both orthogonal and the same dimension, orthogonal n by n, so is AB the product, and BA for that matter. That's a useful little thing. Now, here are two facts about orthogonal matrices, which we didn't do in chapter whatever it was where we did this, 5.3, I guess. And that is because we didn't know about them. But now we know about them. The eigenvalues, and more about those later, of course, of an orthogonal matrix must be plus or minus 1 or complex. Actually, the modulus of them has to be 1. So it complex on the unit disk, to be precise. On the, on the unit uh, circle, rather. So e to the i theta. But real eigenvalues, in particular, have to be plus or minus 1. You cannot have an orthogonal matrix with an eigenvalue of 2 or a half, 0, minus 4. Question? How can they try to trick you by giving you an orthogonal matrix which is not square? Well, that's quite a trick because there is no such thing as an orthogonal matrix which is not square. Do you mean a matrix whose columns are orthonormal to each other, uh, as in they're orthogonal to each other and have length 1, and yet is not an ortho and then try to trick you that it's an orthogonal matrix? I mean, do they have any special properties to make it easy to the So the question is, do they have any special properties? If you have a matrix that's sort of like an orthogonal matrix, but with some of the columns chopped off, basically, so that it's still, they're still orthogonal to each other, they still have length 1, but they're not n of them. There are fewer than n of them. Um, they do have some nice properties. They don't have these specific properties because a lot of them have to do with, I mean, I think all of them have to do essentially with the fact that, uh, that A is square. Okay? Um, now, the one thing that I would say, well, maybe the first uh, B and C might survive, but the, the way that I see that coming up more often is, say, when you are dealing with an orthogonal projection matrix. Then you get exactly the sort of thing that you're talking about, and I will, dis I will be doing that fairly soon, and I will tie into what I've just, what, what I've just said, and I'll, I'll make a comment about that. Okay, so that's where I can think of those matrices that you're talking about coming up. Okay? Would A transpose A be the identity? Yes, A transpose A would then be the identity, um, of, of a different dimension, but A, A transpose would not be the idea. Okay, and I'll talk about this. I promise I will talk about this very soon. But I wanted to mention, while I'm talking about orthogonal matrices, just the fact that the eigenvalues have complex length, uh, have modulus 1. So in particular, if they're real, they must be plus or minus 1. That's a fact. And similarly, also, the determinant of, an I, of, of such a matrix, determinant of A, well, if A is orthogonal, its determinant must be plus or minus 1. That, that's a fact. OK, now. These facts are not given letters because the converses of these statements are not true in general. If the determinant of a matrix is 1 or minus 1, that does not promise that it's orthogonal. But okay. The first one is not really the this one here? Yeah. If A is orthogonal, so is A inverse. Well, it's not a characterization of orthogonal matrices in a sense. I mean, I cannot say that because A has a certain property which I might say is blue. Suppose I say A is blue, so is A inverse. Does that mean blue is orthogonal? It's the same as orthogonal? So what I'm saying is if A transpose is orthogonal. Yeah. Yes, that one, right, that one the converse is true, sure. 
but it's not a characterization of orthogonal matrices per se. Um, neither is this, and certainly, yes, if you come up with a matrix whose eigenvalues are plus or minus one, it need not be orthogonal. Here is an example of a matrix whose eigenvalues are both one. That classic matrix. If you compute the eigenvalues, in fact, it's upper triangular, and as I'll be saying, I mean, that's the triangular matrices, the eigenvalues are along the diagonal. So this has eigenvalues one and one. Multiplicity is two. And yet it's not orthogonal. You can see it very clearly because, first of all, that column is not orthogonal to that column. And what's more, this column has length root two instead of one. So this is not orthogonal. And yet its eigenvalues are plus or minus one. And it's, in fact, they're both one. And what's more, its determinant is one as well. It's not orthogonal. So you cannot reverse these two statements in particular. But if you happen to know the matrix is orthogonal, then you know something about its eigenvalues. OK, so that's what I wanted to say about orthogonal matrices. See, I'm trying to gather these facts for you in the most coherent manner possible. Hopefully, it's not too turgid just to spit them all out. But it's sort of hard to come up with direct examples. And I feel like I lose the thread, as I said. I'd rather leave more time for questions after I've finished going through all this. All right. So the third thing I want to talk about within this topic is orthogonal projection. OK, so what do I have to say about this? If V is a subspace of Rn, then we can always write any vector as the sum of two other vectors. So there's a decomposition into x perp, uh, x parallel rather, plus x perp. This is pre-midterm stuff, but it's relevant and it's important to sort of reiterate in this topic. We can always write this where the perpendicular, uh, the parallel rather, is in v, and the perpendicular is in v perp. And the picture is this. Here's v. Here's x. Here's x parallel. And that is x perp. So it's at right angles, not just to the x parallel, but to the entire subspace of v, any vector in v. This is at right angles. OK, so that's a fact. And related to that fact is that the distance from x to v is defined to be the length of x perp. So actually, how far is this vector from this subspace? Well, this part doesn't really matter because it's in the subspace. You're looking for this perpendicular distance here, which is the length of x perp. Okay, that's a useful fact. That's just by definition. All right, so that's the sort of background. And then what it comes down to is this. If P is the projection, onto V, projection onto V, then P of X is equal to X parallel by definition. That's the definition. So when I say the projection, I mean you decompose X into the bit that's in V plus the bit that's in V perp. And there's, there's only one way of doing that. It's a unique decomposition. And so I just throw away the perpendicular part, and I get the projection. OK, so it's important to know that. This is orthogonal projection. 
just called projection most of the time. in some sense. So let's just look at some properties of P. If P is a projection matrix, is such a projection, then we have two things. P is symmetric. So P transpose equals P. And P squared equals P. The second one is easier to see. Why is P squared equal to P? Because when you do P once, you land in the subspace V. It throws away all the stuff that's not in the subspace. So then if you do another P to what you've gotten, which is the same as P squared of the original, then you don't change it. You're already in the subspace. If x is already in v, px is just x. So p squared doesn't do anything extra. Question? p squared equals p is certainly not true for all symmetric matrices, p. No, not at all. In fact, it's a very special set of symmetric matrices that that's true. So actually, let's uh, explore this for one second. Hey, why not? It goes something like this. If, if P is symmetric and P squared equals P, then P is an orthogonal projection. So it's, this is the converse of the other statement. If P is an orthogonal projection here, I say, then it's symmetric and p squared equals p. Now I'm telling you, well, if p is symmetric and p squared equals p, it must be a projection. And to see why and relate this statement to it and answer your question all at the same time, it's worth remembering, OK, I'm going to skip ahead. I didn't say the spectral theorem yet, but now that we've seen it, I have a liberty to say, OK, we may remember that symmetric matrices are diagonalizable by orthogonal matrices. That's the spectral theorem. Again, I'll be doing it in a greater detail, but see the idea here is that P can be written as S D S inverse, where S is orthogonal and S uh, and D is diagonal. And that's the spectral theorem. And so what this means is P squared is S D squared S inverse. We've seen this. Powers of P or a matrix in diagonal form, all you have to do is take the power of the diagonal. And so this is supposed to be equal, if P squared equals P as it does for a projection, or if you do it by assumption, then you have S D S inverse is S D squared S inverse. And so by multiplying on the left by S inverse and on the right by S, you can get the diagonal matrix equals the diagonal matrix squared. So D equals, or D squared equals D. But what is D? D is a matrix of eigenvalues. And D squared has the square of these eigenvalues. And everything else is 0. It's really easy to square a diagonal matrix. You just take the square of each element. So these are supposed to be equal. If, so if the original p squared equals p, then the s doesn't really matter. It's the d, the d squared equals d. So this means that lambda 1 squared equals lambda 1. Lambda 2 squared equals lambda 2 and so on. Every eigenvalue square has to be equal to the eigenvalue itself. And the only numbers which equal their own square are 0 and 1. So every eigenvalue equals 0 or 1. We'll write it 
in that case, I'm going to transfer over here because there's more room. We may as well write the diagonal with all the ones first and the zeros second, as in after it. So having started with the assumption that our matrix P is symmetric, which allows us to use the spectral theorem, and that P squared equals P, which allows us to conclude that the eigenvalues are 0 or 1, we can write them out in the order so that P is equal to S 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, S inverse. And because S is an orthogonal matrix, again, that's the spectral theorem, you find without too much difficulty that all you end up with is a projection onto an appropriate subspace. You have to look at the columns of this matrix. But since they form an orthonormal basis, you basically project onto the first lot of them, however many there are there. So there's a bit more work to be done, but this leads quite straightforwardly onto the fact that P is an orthogonal projection onto the image of P, whatever it is. So whatever the, you started with this weird matrix, is, which equals its own square and is symmetric, you look at its image, and this proves essentially, minus this little detail here, at the end that P must be its a pr a orthogonal projection onto its own image. And actually, what this means is, in other words, just to sort of summarize it, <laughs> eigenvalues of an orthogonal projection P are all 0 and 1. And the eigenvectors, or eigenspaces, are E1, the eigenspace corresponding to 1, is V itself. And the eigenspace cor corresponding to 0 is V perp. V perp gets sent to zero. This is also for the goal of P. The eigenspace cor corresponding to zero is the kernel, by definition. Again, I, I, obviously when we first looked at orthogonal projections, we weren't talking about eigenspaces. But now that this is the final review, even though I haven't gone over that stuff explicitly, I, I expect that you have some recollection, however vague, of what these terms mean. All right. Now, a couple more things to say about orthogonal projections. OK, so P is not invertible. Projection P is not invertible since it has a kernel. Orthogonal matrices are invertible. I'm sorry, invertible matrices have a zero kernel. So the exception is if V is all of Rn, that's kind of a, that is a sub. virtue of having a horrible expression like yeah is that it only happens when the microphone comes off and then of course can't hear it on the video because the microphone's come off that's my story and i'm sticking to it um right if v is all of rn then this decomposition up here is really stupid because x is just this x perp is nothing so in that case the projection is the identity. So that's boring. You don't, you don't worry about that case. The projection is just not, I mean, it's just the identity. So uh, otherwise, and sure, the identity is invertible. So if the, if, if the V is a proper subspace, meaning not all of Rn, then P is not invertible. So of course, it cannot be an orthogonal matrix itself because orthogonal matrices are invertible. OK, so something that I'm going to ask. Uh, is an orthogonal projection matrix orthogonal? Absolutely not. It just has the word orthogonal in both of these concepts to confuse you. 
or something like that. No, it makes sense as long as you say projection. So think of the projection as the important word as opposed to orthogonal projection. Projection. Okay. Now, here is going back to the question earlier that you asked about what if a matrix has columns which are orthonormal but not n of them. Okay, so suppose that V, so, so for com computation of P, part one, if V, so, okay, now what I'm talking about is I give you some particular vectors V, and I would like to say what is the projection matrix? You have to compute this. Okay, so if V can be written as the span of, say, U1 up to Um, where, and I think I need to move to the other board just for clarity here. here. So the idea is you have a subspace, and you don't know in general what a basis is for that, but if you're lucky enough to have a subspace, a basis rather, which is orthonormal for the subspace, so where u1 up to um are orthonormal, meaning that each length is one and they're all orthogonal to each other, then you form the matrix Q Now this is exactly the sort of matrix you were talking about earlier. It's not square, it's n by m. So it's longer, it's taller than it is wide. Each column has length one in the sense that the sum of the squares of the column is, is one. And every column is orthogonal to every other column. Every pair of columns is orthogonal. But this is not an orthogonal matrix unless it happens to be square because it's not square, <laughs> unless it is square. OK, but what I'm saying is most of the time it's not square. If it were square, then v would be the span of n vectors, which means that v would be all of Rn, which is the stupid case that I said I'm not interested in. OK, so Q is exactly this sort of matrix. Um, Q transpose Q is the identity, m-dimensional. That's a fact, and it follows directly from the computation of A transpose A that I had written up with that big matrix of dot products. However, it turns out the, the projection that we want, P, is equal to Q, Q transpose. And it's important that you get that order correct. This is an N by N matrix. Whereas Q transpose Q is an M by M matrix, which is very boring because it's just the identity. This is a projection matrix, on the other hand, Q, Q transpose. OK, so this provides a sort of prescription of how to find a projection matrix. You have a subspace. You find an orthonormal basis for the subspace, M vectors. You write those vectors as columns, and you compute this quantity, Q, Q transpose. OK, so this works. This is what you use. Use this method. If given an orthonormal if given a basis which is at least orthogonal, as in every pair of vectors is orthogonal, in which case normalize each vector first. And by normalize, what I mean is divide by the length. So just to remind you what that means, normalize means replace v by v over its length. That makes it into a unit vector. OK, so 
This is the method to use if you have an orthonormal basis or if you can make an orthonormal basis by something very straightforward. Of course, you can always make an orthonormal basis by using Gram-Schmidt, but you know that's a pain. So then the question is, what if you only just have a regular basis? But I want to really emphasize that if you can do this, it's much simpler. So this is what you should do if you can. And I, I will give an example of this in a second. Oh, if you had a non-orthonormal basis, you could find an orthonormal basis by using Gram-Schmidt and then do this. But Gram-Schmidt takes a while. It can take a while. And so there is another method that, involved, that avoids Gram-Schmidt even if you don't have an orthonormal basis. Unfortunately, it is a more complicated formula, and here it is. So this is computation part two. If V is the span of V1 up to Vm, where these are not orthogonal or orthonormal, well, not necessarily orthonormal, well, again, you form the matrix, which I'll now call A, just to be consistent with the but you no longer have the nice formula that you had before. It turns out that P is equal to A, A transpose A inverse A transpose. And compared to this. And you'll see that it's much more pleasant to compute Q, Q transpose than it is to compute A a transpose A inverse A transpose. Okay, there's, there's three matrix multiplications to be done and one inverse there. So that's pretty nasty. Okay, so that's why I don't like to do that one if I can avoid it. But sometimes you really sort of don't, you can't help it. I don't know, it's a bit of a toss up as to whether it's easier to use Gram Schmidt and then this or use this formula by itself. Now, by the way, just to tie this into something we said before. I mentioned that if the kernel of A is zero, then so is the kernel of A transpose A. That's in the section when I did transpose both. And therefore, this, this matrix should be invertible. So to, to know that this matrix is invertible, all you need to know is that the kernel of A is zero. And the kernel of A will be zero when these are linearly independent. That's, that's another characterization. So if these are linearly independent, this inverse is guaranteed to make sense. If you use this and find that the thing is not invertible, well, guess what? You need to take away a vector at least because you have redundancy there. You have a span of too many vectors if you don't have a basis. So this has to be a basis here, actually. And this also has to be here, a basis. But I already said there, specifically orthonormal. So this has to be a basis. If it's, if right, so in the case, <laughs> as you point out, if they do happen to be orthonormal, then A transpose A is the identity, and it completely boils down to the previous formula. But there's no need to compute it. <laughs> you just have to, it's better to learn it as a separate formula. And then, and then they don't start just computing transpose A and saying, oh, hey, it's the identity. Oh, wait, I knew that. Okay, there goes five minutes of exam time, three minutes or whatever. But you're absolutely right. This formula is the general formula which reduces to that in the pleasant thing. And by the way, I don't actually have to say that these are a basis if they happen to be orthonormal because them being orthonormal means in immediately that they are linearly independent. You can't have orthonormal vectors which are not linearly independent. So that was not necessary there, but here it's sort of necessary. And if I don't specify that this is actually a basis, then this won't be invertible. But you can salvage the situation by culling the vectors to get a basis. OK, so how about I give an example? And this came from an actual final. Oh, maybe I'll say one other fact before I, before I do. And then I'll use that fact in this example. 
I forget which final this was in. Oh yeah, no, spring 07, a year ago. So here's another fact. So the projection onto V perp, well, if P is the projection onto V, and P, say, I'll call it P tilde, is the projection onto V perp, then actually there's quite a simple formula for P tilde. It is true that Px is the x parallel. So, and P tilde, the projection onto the perp, is actually the x perp part. So in fact, P of x plus P tilde of x is x the part in V plus x the part in V perp. So this is the projection onto V. This is the projection onto V perp. And that is actually x. That's true for any vector x. The projection onto one subspace and the projection onto the rest of it, the orthogonal complement, add up to the original, i.e. P plus P tilde equals the identity as a matrix. That's a useful fact that the textbook doesn't really emphasize, but it's tremendously helpful for solving this next problem. So I will actually pull out an example now and solve it, and then let's see, it's probably going to be time for a break then, maybe long overdue. Well, not on. I'll just do this example first. So this comes from spring 07, as I said. It says the following. You have a, a subspace V of R4. That is the intersection of x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 equals 0. And x1 minus x2 plus x3 minus x4 equals 0. OK, so this is actually a three-dimensional subspace of R4. There's three degrees of freedom. And then once you know three of these coordinates, the other one is specified. This is also a three-dimensional subspace. So their intersection is probably two-dimensional. Could be three-dimensional if they happen to be the same subspace, but they're clearly not. So it should be a two-dimensional subspace here. And so the question is in three parts. A, find an orthonormal basis. for V perp. B, find the projection matrix, matrix, onto V perp. And C, find the projection matrix onto V. Seems a little counterintuitive because actually you end up working with V perp most of the time. All right, well, for part A, we need to consider a vector which is perpendicular to V. We want two vectors which are perpendicular to V. All right, well, Here's the thing. You can find a vector which is perpendicular to this subspace just by taking the coefficients, 1, 1, 1, 1. And one that's perpendicular to this subspace by taking the coefficients 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1. OK, that seems fairly straightforward. So let's just check that each one is, in fact, a, a, a correct basis vector. So let's just start first by letting v1 be 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay, 
So I claim that that is perpendicular to V per. I, I'm sorry, that that is in V per. per. Is this in V per? per? Well, to do that, it has to be perpendicular to everything in V. So this means, if so, this means that V1 dot V equals 0 for all V in the subspace V. OK, well, look, if V is in V, and v equals x1, x2, x3, x4, then we know x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 equals 0. That's the first equation up there. OK, we know that. Because everything in v satisfies that. It's in the intersection of this with something else. But interpret it as a dot product, i.e. 1, 1, 1, 1 dot x1, x2, x3, x4 equals 0. See, that's the dot product with this and that. So this is indeed, that is orthogonal to that. So this shows that 1, 1, 1, 1 is in V perp directly. And you, you don't even have to prove it, but you could just sort of say, oh, well, the coefficients. But sure enough, that is orthogonal to the entire sub space just of the first equation up there. And therefore, it's orthogonal to the intersection. And similarly, if v2 equals 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, then v2 dot x1, x2, x3, x4 is indeed x1 minus x2 plus x3 minus x4. I just took the coefficients 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, and dotted them in. And by the second equation, that's 0. So that shows that V2 is also orthogonal to everything in V, because it's orthogonal to everything satisfying the second equation. OK, so it's sort of, <laughs> it's really just looking at exactly the matrix stuff in dot product in a slightly different way. But I rather suspect that it confused a number of people. I wasn't involved with the course, so I guess I'll never know. Anyway, we have two vectors, v1 and v2. So we have v1 and v2 equals 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1. And these span v perp. And clearly, they're independent. Now, suppose the question had immediately been, find the projection onto v perp. OK? So remember, I gave you two methods, one involving q, q transpose, and the other involving a, a transpose, a, a inverse, a transpose. So which one would you do? Well, you, these are not orthonormal. This, 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 these are not orthonormal. So you can't do q, q transpose. But if you look at their dot product, you will see it's 0. It happens that v1 dot v2 is 0. So all you have to do is replace them by their lengths. And then you can do it. As it happens, you're guided through it anyway. So the fact is, it says find an orthonormal basis. Let's just let u1, the, the length of this is 4, square root of 4 is 2. So u1 is 1 half, 1 half, 1 half, 1 half. And u2 is a rock band, but it's also 1 half, minus 1 half, 1 half, and minus 1 half, because the length of it happens to be 2 as well. So I'm just dividing by 2. And you'll see that this has length 1, and this is, has length 1. Now the question is, are they orthog orthogonal? And the answer is miraculously yes. And you don't have to do Graham Schmidt. A question. How do I know that the span of v perp is going to be two-dimensional? Two OK, so uh, you, you remember I was sort of burbling to myself that actually both of these equations up there give you three-dimensional subspaces. And the intersection of two three-dimensional subspaces is, in general, a three-dimensional subspace, but not necessarily. It could be, in fact, a three-dimensional subspace. 
if they are the same subspace. Well, if you have any equation there that looks like, say, with, with the four variables, okay, in a four-dimensional space, you have x1, x2, x3, x4. You don't know anything about them. You get a, that's a four-dimensional thing. Now, if you put one constraint on that says, if you know three, then I'll give you the fourth, which is what either of those equations do, then that means you have three degrees of freedom, but not the fourth. Because if you know three of the coordinates, the fourth is prescribed for you. Okay, that means if you're standing in the subspace, there's three different directions you can go and have freedom. You try to go the fourth direction, and no, 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 there's a constraint. Now, the other one gives you another constraint, and then the question is those two constraints would mean that if you know two of them, you should be able to work out the other two. But if they're not independent, as in they were the same subspace altogether, then, of course, you could still get a three-dimensional subspace. And then another question here. How would you find the what? How would you find a basis of V? Oh, well, that's a little more tricky. You have to start finding the kernel of a matrix. There's no straightforward way to write down a basis of V. You, you could do it, actually, if you... Um, actually, you know what? There is probably a straightforward way of doing it. What you do is you specify two of the variables, to say x3 and x4, and then you see what x1 and x2 have to be that satisfy those equations. So uh, if you say x3 is 1 and x4 is 0, then you just have to solve the equations x1 plus x2 plus 1 equals 0, x1 minus x2 plus 1 equals 0, or not 1, but x3. And then, and then you let x4 be 0, and then you solve for these two, and you will find the two vectors that, that make up a basis. So these are all different ways of answering the same question. In some sense, you know, why does v have to be two-dimensional? Uh, why does v-perp have to be two-dimensional? You can find all these things directly. Okay. By the way, if you have any two, think in three dimensions. If I have two planes in R3 which pass through the origin, remember subspaces have to pass through the origin. So I'll give you two planes that pass through the origin. What, what is their intersection? It could be a line or it could be the plane <laughs> It could be a plane, but the only way it'll be the pl a plane is if both the planes are the same. It cannot just be a point. Not if both the planes pass through the origin. It's just impossible, geometrically. Uh, you have to be a little careful because if these are three-dimensional subspaces of R5, then all you know this changes the whole thing. I mean, so if, if they're both... Uh, if you have two hyperplanes, then they'll unless they're the same, they'll intersect in one that's two dimensions less than the ambient dimension. But hyperplane means they already started as one dimension less. So in this case, four, and each of these sub things are three. Their intersection is two. Another question. Yeah, if those things, if, there's, if there were not zeros there in the right side, then, then it's not a subspace. Okay, so it has to be a zero there. And, and to find a perpendicular vector to a, a hyperplane is easy. You read off the coefficients, right? And then the insight geometrically is that that's perpendicular to everything in the three-dimensional subspace. So, of course, it's also perpendicular to everything in a two-dimensional subspace of it. And then similarly with the other one. So you kind of just read off the vectors. You don't need to write this down in the solution. You could do as the official solutions did. Oh, say, well, you know, it's just 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1. We just read off the coefficients. We know that works. This explains in more detail why it works. However, as I said, that's not an orthonormal basis. To make it into an orthonormal basis, you have to divide by the length in each case, which is 2. And then notice that they happen to be orthogonal. And we still are only on part A, but go ahead. No, no other questions? Question or just? Okay, two planes. I mean, this is of course three-dimensional in four, but yeah. it's hard to visualize. So. Yep. 
How does it work? Okay, let, let me just show you this. Okay, so for, for um, okay, let me say it this way. Suppose you had two planes that intersect in a line. Like that. Okay, and you have here is an orthogonal vector to the first plane. That plane. And here is an orthogonal vector to this plane. Both these vectors are orthogonal to the line. So they form a basis, not necessarily orthonormal, but they form a basis for the orthogonal plane to this line here. Okay? And it was just lucky that the two vectors that we happened to get were at right angles. Otherwise, we would have had to use Gram-Schmidt. But they were not of length 1, so we had to just scale them down to length 1. So part B says compute the orthogonal projection. And now, mercifully, this is quite easy. Uh, what we do is we form our matrix Q, which has 1 half, 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 minus 1 half. And again, I want to emphasize that if part A had not said find an orthonormal basis, just find a basis, you, you should do this anyway, because this is much simpler. Q transpose happens to equal, take the first column and write it as a row. And then just multiply them together in that order. P is, P is Q, Q transpose. And so you end up with this times this, which is a half times a half plus a half times a half. That's a quarter plus a quarter. Then you have this times this, which works out to be 0. You have this times this, which is again a half. And by symmetry, this times this is 0. OK? Now then you have the second one. This times this is 0. But actually, that's a waste of time. How do I know that that's 0 without doing any work? Answer, this matrix that you get is symmetric. So you only really need to worry about stuff above there, because everything else follows. We do have to worry about the diagonal. You get a half minus a half, a half minus a half. That's another half. This and this, zero. This and this will be a half. That seems to be a pattern here. By symmetry, this is also a half. This is also zero. So I now move on to the third by the third. Oh, look, it's another bloody half. Uh, this and this gives me a zero. Now I know automatically this is the same as this, which is zero. This is the same as this by symmetry, which is a half. This is the same as this, which is zero. And wouldn't you believe the last one works out to be another half. So that's the projection in this particular case. It's sort of uh, very nicely tiled. Now, that's part B. Now, part C said calculate the orthogonal projection onto V. Everything so far is V perp. This is projection onto V perp. After all, these are basis vectors, the columns, for V perp. So to do V, do you then need to find basis vectors for V? Orthonormal basis vectors, and then do this computation? No, the projection onto V is the identity minus the projection onto V perp. which is just the identity minus the matrix that we found, which is 1, 1, 1, 1 minus this. And that's pretty straightforward to work out. It turns out to be, so you just take 1 minus this diagonal is a half. But here, you get 0 minus a half, because the identity matrix is 0 here. So you're going to get a minus a half. And then you'll get 0, a half, 0, minus a half. Minus a half, 0, 1 half, 0. And finally, 0, minus a half, 0, a half. So it's also a projection matrix. It just happens to be the sort of other piece. OK, a question and then a break. 
Yeah, yep, one thing. Sure, if you want to find the projection onto V and you don't remember the connection with V perp projection, then yeah, you probably have to find an orthonormal basis for for V, and then you know, one way of doing that is to find the kernel of this. The kernel of this, if you want to just operate directly on this, will be a, a basis for V. Because after all, the projection onto V perp kills vectors which are in V. So the kernel of this would be probably the simplest thing to find out. It's actually very easy to see what the kernel of this is. I think it's the span of 1, 0, minus 1, 0, and 0, 1, 0, minus 1. I think you can just see that. You know, if you, if you hit this matrix with 1, 0, minus 1, 0, well, clearly it's going to be in the kernel. And this is going to be in the kernel. And then if to make them orthonormal, you have to put a root 2 and everything, 1 over root 2, because the length of this is root 2. And then if you multiply those together, you will get this. In, in the QQ transfers way, you'll get this. So you might as well check that. That's not a bad little exercise. All right, so I have one more topic to discuss within the first major topic, one more subtopic, if you will, which is least squares. Now, I have to tell you something about least squares. It just so happens that looking at the finals that were available on Blackboard, the so maybe that means we're due for one, or maybe not. But anyway, with the view to getting through everything that I want to get through, I'm just going to tell you, remind you the theory, and I'm, I'm not going to do an example. We, we did actually quite a lot of examples in the weekly reviews. And then maybe we'll come up with some uh, from in the Q&A. But for the moment, let's go through the facts. And there's really not too many, given everything else we've done about projections. OK. So I'm going to make a claim that is something that relates to orthogonal projections. The projection onto V of x, which we were calling P before. This explicitly says what the subspace V is. This is the vector in V closest. Here they all come to x. And again, the picture is that here is V, here is my x, and I have this projection down here, which is x parallel, less the same as the projection. And I'm saying if we try to track x, but are forced to stay in the subspace, the best we can do is this projection. It's, it is like a shadow. It's like a shadow, one way of thinking of it. So you're frantically running around the subspace saying, oh, I want to get near you, I want to get near you. But actually, the best you can do is the shadow, because you're stuck in the subspace. OK, so this is the picture of this. And the actual thing is that projection of x onto v minus x, actually let's say it like this, the length of the difference vector, which is actually the length of x perp, and th this is less than x minus v for any other v in the subspace, capital B, v. So th this is an example of a vector in capital V, and it's the best one. It minimizes this quantity. Okay, so that's a fact that informs everything about least squares. So the least squares solution. So least squares solution to a x equals b. Well, if you could solve this equation for x, then there's no need to do least squares. Okay, You might want to annotate that. If there is a solution, well, maybe I'll even say it. OK, as an aside, sidebar, comment. If there is a solution, no need for, for least squares. i.e., B is in the image of A. No, 
there is a solution. If capital I, if B is in the image of I of A, there is a solution. By definition, the image of A are the vectors that are of the form AX for some X. So if B is in the image of A, there's a solution. If not, then the least squares is by definition, or it means rather, and this is important. I've seen questions that tested this sort of level of, of theoretical understanding. So least squares solution X star to this equation, sorry to squish this in, a least squares solution x star to the equation ax equals b means that ax star is closer to b, or at least as close as anything that you could possibly get for any x. Okay, so if you can't solve this directly, ax equals b, you settle for second best. You settle for some x star such that ax star is close to b. The difference is as little as you can do. It minimized, if you like, least. Any other choice of x is at least as far away from b. Okay, so it's important you understand that that's what it means. Now, by the way, there is a strict less than up here because the projection is the one and only. But in this case, you may not have an, a unique least square solution. There may be more, and we'll see in a second when that happens. There may be more than one. And if there were more than one, then you'd have an equals possible here, when x is not even x star. There might be another x star that works. All right, now, given this definition, that's what it means to have a least square solution. So any least square solution satisfies this normal equation. Well, first of all, AX star has to be the projection of B onto the image of A. That's a special subspace. Okay, so let's look at the geometry of this really quickly. So A starts off taking this entire space, actually all of it, it's not just a, a bit of it, it's the whole uh, space. I don't know how to extend that to everything. And it maps it into, say, not everything. If it did map it into everything, then you could solve the equation. So let's just assume that A boils things down to just one plane, say. So it takes a three-dimensional vector, but everything AX, as in the image, is only two-dimensional. And you'd like to solve AX equals B. But you can't, because when you take A of anything, you land up in here. So you're trapped. You're doing exactly the uh, uh, sort of thing that you can't get outside of here. So you settle for the best possible world, and this is where A X star will be. And this subspace here is the image of A, the plane. So there's the picture. A X star should be the closest you can do to B while still staying, of course, in the image of A, because A X star has to be in the image of A. And this is the projection. And then if you actually unwind the math, and it's not too hard to do based on the formulas for projection, but you're allowed to show that, well, computation shows. So that's the geometry here. This is geometry, geometrical. And then the actual equation is called the normal equation, and it just boils this down into A transpose A X star is equal to A transpose B. It turns out that that's what you get when you chase this around. So if you solve this, so you, remember you're given 
you're given A and B. So you can find and can compute A transpose A as well as A transpose times vector B and you'll get matrix times X star equals vector where the matrix happens to be A transpose A so it's actually symmetric matrix by what we've said symmetric matrix times x star equals sum of vector and we know how to solve those I mean you can solve it by Gauss Jordan elimination there may not be a unique solution as we know there may not be a unique solution but there will be at least one solution of this all right so that is one observation and then the only other so that's sort of an explanation of this, of how to compute with this. And then the only other thing to note is that if the kernel of A happens to be equal to zero, then as we've said, A transpose A is invertible. So you can take that normal equation and write it as X star is explicitly A transpose A inverse a transpose B. And there, there is a unique least square solution. So if the kernel of A is zero, you get a unique least square solution which is given by that, which you can compute. Otherwise, you do not get a unique one. After all, if you add any element of the kernel of A to X star, you will get the same A X star. You get the same value because the bit you added contributes nothing. So that's all I really want to say about least squares, okay? I mean, there's examples, there's curve fittings and all this sort of stuff, but I'm going to save it for the Q&A. If you really want to, you can watch the video where I talked all about this at length, but I want to move on. So, I have half an hour, and I'm going to try to say as much about determinants as I can. And then I'll stop at 10, and I will continue tomorrow. I, don't, I doubt I'll get through all of the stuff tomorrow, but I tried to pace it so that I, it won't take all of the third session, and we'll have time for Q&A then. And then maybe the fourth session doesn't have to go even that late. We'll see how your questions go. All right. So, determinants. Big topic number two. Okay, so I break this up into three subtopics. How to compute properties and significance. Let's start off with how to compute. Okay, well, look, you, you need to know the 2 by 2 very well. That's the AD minus BC. The 3 by 3, you could use the Saris thing or expansion. I personally use the expansion. So if I'm taking a determinant of a 3 by 3, It's simple enough to me to go this times that determinant minus this times this determinant plus this times that determinant. Okay, it didn't look very clear, but that, that's kind of how I do it anyway. Now, you do need to know how to do a general expansion of a determinant. Occasionally, this does get asked. And of course, as you know from doing eigenvalues, you need determinants. You can't find the eigenvalues most of the time without determinants. So, you need to know how to do the bigger expansion. So, you have this formula here in general. Det A is equal to J equals 1 to N. 
minus 1 to the i plus j a i j debt this minor here and this is expansion along row i never seen a question which actually required writing down that formula i'm not saying it's impossible but the point of the formula as far as we seem to be concerned is to use it is to use it okay and the way to use it is this you have your big square matrix just write down plus minus plus minus however many you need and make a checkerboard and so on depends how big the matrix is but you make this checkerboard and you're gonna pick your rope okay so let's suppose you pick this rope Okay, circle one element, cross out everything here, and look at the rest of the matrix that doesn't involve this row, this row, or this column. And you compute the determinant of the smaller piece. And then you multiply it by this element. But because there's a minus there, you have to put a minus in front of what you just computed. That, my friends, is just one term. Then you go on to the next one and uncross out the column. But this same row always gets crossed out. So now you cross out that column and you compute this determinant. So it's bung, 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 bung. And of course, to do that, you have to repeat the process maybe. But anyway, you compute that determinant, and then you multiply it by this number, and you put a plus in front of it. Then you repeat with this, then this, and then uh, until you've exhausted the row and yourself. Okay? That's what that formula means. And the thing you have to be aware, so when you start with the top row, it's always plus, minus, plus, minus. And, you know, the same is true of the third row and the fifth row, but unfortunately, if you do an even row like the second or the fourth, you actually have to start with a minus. And that's all built into this formula here. But the fact is, this, this checkerboard of pluses and minuses is exactly what it means. Okay? I mean, technically, these are called the minors, these quantities here, and all that sort of stuff, but uh, essentially, that's what it gets. And you can also do the same for columns using the same grid and the same technique if you say pick this column here you start there you cross out this row and this column and you have this sub matrix like this and you take that determinant times that entry with a minus and then so on and so on and so on down the column and here the difference is it's the same column crossed out every time in different rows It's the same pluses and minuses for the column. In fact, the formula is the same, but you sum over i instead, and you pick, you, you pick the j. And it turns out, okay, so the formula, if you just change that j to an i, then instead of summing across a row, you'll be summing along a column. But the, the checkerboard is determined by i plus j. So if i plus j happens to be even, then you get a plus. So here it's 1 plus 1 is 2. Here it's 1 plus 2 is 3. And then 1 plus 3, and so on. So it's the, since it's the same formula, it's the same checkerboard. And the, it's, it's a sort of an amazing fact, in a way, that you get the same answer, if you do it correctly, of course, no matter which row or which column you go down. You get the same answer. So it's independent. OK? Now that's one way of computing it. And this is the way to compute if the matrix is sparse in the sense that there's a lot of zeros, particularly if there's a lot of zeros in one row or one column, grab that and expand along there first. That should save you a lot of time. And I've seen some examples in previous finals where that's what you want to do. Okay, so again, I wouldn't get too hung up on this formula here as a sort of, as the formula, but do, do understand it as a way of actually doing the computations and make sure you practice these things. Okay. On the other hand, 
you don't need to worry about this if the matrix is triangular. If A is triangular, either upper or lower, or even upper and lower, which would mean diagonal, that's upper and lower triangular. In any of these cases, then det A, the determinant of A, is the product of the diagonal entries. That's a big old time saver. That follows straight from this expansion. As it happens, we also know that the determinant of A is the product of the eigenvalues. And the eigenvalues of a triangular matrix, as I said earlier, although I'll reiterate it and write it down, are actually its diagonal entries. So that's consistent with that. A question? Uh, OK, so the question is, if you have a diagonal matrix that is like this, is there a shortcut? And, and zero everywhere else? If you have that and it's zero everywhere else, then the determinant will be the product of these, but maybe with the plus or minus. So you have to be a little careful. You have to be a little careful. So for example, in two dimensions, you compute the determinant of this, it's minus one. In three dimensions, if you compute the determinant of this, then it will be also minus one. So maybe it is always minus the, the product. I, see, I'm not, I'm not confident about it. Uh, you could also switch the rows around, but then you have to count how many times you switch the rows around. So yeah, this, I, I don't want to say it because I'm not 100% sure. On the basis of two examples, it looks like it's minus, but uh, I have to be a little careful. Four and five are, are actually even? OK. They should be plus. OK, so you see, that's the danger of looking at two. So you might want to prove that the, that the first, you know, it goes minus, minus, plus, plus, minus. That's a proof by induction sort of problem. OK, so again, I, uh, there may be a formula, but I didn't know it, and I would, I would be suspicious and would have to investigate it. So, OK? So, actually, you can do it by induction quite easily, you see. I mean, if you know this determinant is minus 1, and you stick now a 1 up here, right? then you have plus, minus, plus, minus. And so actually, yes, you will get 1. And then you put another 1 there, and that will be in the plus position. So you will get 1. And then you work your way up, and you'll see that that one will be minus again. So yeah, he's quite right. But anyway, that's a different problem altogether. All right. The other method, of course, is by Gauss-Jordan. And this is quite a good method. And this is how actual com you know, computers actually use this algorithm, because to do this first one is recursive and disgusting. So to do Gauss-Jordan, when you do an elimination, the thing to remember is there are three different steps. And you need to understand how these steps affect the determinant. So, the first thing is that, well, I'll do it like this. If you multiply a row by k, the determinant also gets multiplied by k. So one of the things we do is multiply or divide a row by a number. And then the determinant has the same property. If you switch two adjacent rows, or actually any two rows, if you actually switch two rows around, so the determinant multiplies by minus 1, and then it changes sign. Yeah, but I mean, if you switch, so if you have 1 and 3, say, and you actually switch 1 and 3, the way you do that is you switch 1 and 2, then you switch 2 and 3, and then you switch 1 and 3. 
No, I got that the wrong way around. One, two, three. You, you want to switch one and three with adjacent swaps. Okay, so switch two and one, switch three and one, switch three and two. And you will have switched one and three with three steps, each of which has a minus one. So actually it turns out that switching any two rows, actually switching them, but not, not, you're not allowed to top, put the top row on the bottom. That's not a switch. You actually have to physically cross out one row and another row and then rewrite the first row into the, the, the other one. And so actually switch them around, then the determinant will be multiplied by minus one. Okay? Now, on the other hand, the tricky operation, which is to add a multiple of one row to another, Mercifully, the determinant doesn't change. So that's beautiful. So actually, actually you really, you really, really have, have to count how many times you multiply rows or switches. That's it. So here's a nice example. I will give an example of this and the accounting that is needed. But sort of rather cute example from a previous final. So there was a problem that said, you start with a matrix A, which is four by four. So start with A, four by four, and you do the following five steps. One, you interchange or swap rows one and two. I forget which one this is from, I didn't write it down. But this is from one of the finals on, black, on the blackboard. Add two times row one to row three. Subtract three times row one from row four. Multiply row three by five. And finally, multiply row 2 by 2. So it says you start with some A, and you do these five things in that order, and you end up with the 4 by 4 identity matrix. And part A says, what is debt A? Okay, so it's a very straightforward application without even knowing what A is of what I just said. What is determinant of A? Well, I don't know what it is, but we start with A. So step zero, start with A. And the determinant at that stage is debt A. If you swap rows one and two, the new determinant, you get a new matrix whose determinant is minus debt A, because we switched two rows around. If you add two times of one row to another row, you don't change the determinant. So after that, the new matrix that you get will also have minus debt A. Bless you. Similarly, this doesn't change the determinant. If you multiply a row by 5, you multiply the determinant by 5. So what minus debt A, now you have minus 5 debt A. And similarly, if you multiply row 2 by 2, then that multiplies what you had before by 2. And you get minus 10 debt A. And this is supposed to be the identity which by definition, well, it's a diagonal matrix. The determinant is the product of the diagonals, which is 1. So there's an equation. This matrix that has determinant minus 10 times whatever the original thing is, is actually the identity. So it has determinant 1. So you have the equation minus 10 debt A equals 1. So the determinant of A is minus a tenth. OK, so it just, you just have to be careful 
whether it's minus 10 or minus a tenth. That, that, those are the only sort of two legitimate obvious answers. But this clearly shows the accounting along the way shows that it's actually minus a tenth. Because the manipulations increase the determinant by a factor of minus 10, and you end up with 1. So I mean, a common mistake is what I'm trying to say is minus 10 there instead of minus a tenth. All right? Now, there was actually a part B, which is not germane to this determinants thing, but I might as well say what it was. B is what is A inverse? That's a cute little question that is actually a pre midterm question. What is A inverse? Well, how do you find A inverse? What you do is you start with A and augment it with the 4x4 four four identity, in the case of a 4x4 four four matrix. And you eliminate, you try to eliminate, if you can, A down to the identity, in which case the other part will become A inverse. If you don't get the identity here because you have a lower rank, then A inverse doesn't exist. Are you given the original matrix? Oh, no. You're given what I told you. <laughs> That's the beauty of it. That even without knowing what the original matrix is, you can easily work out its inverse. Of course, you can work out the original matrix, but it's much easier to work out its inverse. See, all you have to do is follow the steps that reduce this to this, a to i4, and the same steps will unreduce i4 to the inverse of a. So you actually, the solution is to apply all these five steps to the identity. So you start with the identity. There's no need to keep writing a every time, because you know a is going to evolve into the identity, because you're given that you started with a at step 0, and you get i4 at the end. OK, so you start with the identity. You swap rows 1 and 2. No, you don't go from the end. The question is, shouldn't you go from the end to the beginning? You don't go from the end to the beginning. If you did, you'd get A back, not A inverse. You're looking for A inverse. That was the question. So it's easier to follow it. And besides, reversing these things is not that obvious either. You can do it, but you, know, you have to be a little careful when it says subtract three times. Anyway, they are reversible, of course. But. Uh, step two is to add two times row one to row three. OK, so that'll give us 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 2, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and 3 times row 1 from row 4 is 0, minus 3, 0, 1. And then we have to multiply row 3 by 5 and row 2 by 2. And we can do them all in one step. Bless you. I did the last two steps in one go. And there's A inverse. Pretty clever, huh? In order, OK. So the procedure for finding an inverse is to take your original matrix and augment by the identity on the right, and then do all the steps in order to simplify A on the left part of it down to the identity, if possible. And you will automatically get the inverse on the right. So we are told that we do all these steps and we get the identity. So if I actually took all of these matrices and threw an A and augmented, A tilde, A tilde tilde, A tilde tilde tilde, and finally A tilde 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 tilde, what, you know, it, it evolves throughout. But the actual the end of it is the identity here. So this is the inverse. Kind of pretty, huh? Now, by the way, oh, a question first. No, no, no. OK, so when it says switch rows 1 and 2, it means take the data in row 1 and switch it with the data in row 2. But you still call it in subsequent rows 1, 2, 3, 4. 
You don't, it doesn't say renumber them. It's just take the contents of row. I mean, I agree there's an ambiguity there. It just means take the numbers that are in row one and replace them with the numbers of row two and vice versa. Subtract three of the new row one, whatever is in row one at this time, from row four. Okay, now by the way, what's the determinant of this matrix? Well, let's compute it by means of an expansion across here. The top row is 0, 1, 0, 0. The 1 is in the second place, which you may remember is plus, minus. Okay, so we need a minus 1 times the determinant of this submatrix. But this submatrix is diagonal. It's 2, 5, 1, and everything else is zeros. So actually, the determinant of A inverse is minus 10. Ah, yes, of course, the determinant of A inverse, as we will see. So we can compute the determinant of A inverse as minus 10 very easily by the expansion. But actually, we know the determinant of A inverse is 1 over the determinant of A. So indeed, minus 10 is indeed 1 over minus a tenth. So that's actually a check of the first part. Or if you prefer, you can do the second part first and then use that to do the first part. Right, so everything is consistent. So take it, take your pick, take your pick. All right, so that's that problem. Any questions about that problem before I move on? Yeah, you. No, 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 no. You, yeah, when it says row one, if you're up to a certain point in the computation and. Row one is the first row, whatever's numbers are in there. It, you don't have to keep track exactly, exactly. So it's as if, forget what you did, there's the matrix you're looking at, there's row one, two, three, four. Okay. Yeah, otherwise it would be a nightmare to try to. You were saying that if you did it in reverse, you get the character? Yeah, no, I think if you did it in reverse, you should, you should get aid back. But you see, when it says multiply, you have to divide. So that's something to worry about there. Otherwise, it's not too difficult. Swap is still a swap. Adding, subtract three lots of row one. You probably have to add three lots of row one. It's still the same row, yeah. Row one is always what your eyes look at as the first, the top row, okay? Maybe it should say the, the top row of what you're looking at, the, the second from the top row of what you're looking at, okay? It's always, that's what it means. It's, it, this is now a language question, of course, but that's that's the... That's the notion. Otherwise, it would be hopeless. Hopeless. It doesn't really mean anything. The, the, the point of this algorithm is that the steps are all sort of independent from each other. It's, you, you can sort of look at any way, and they're all reversible too. OK, so anyway, that's, part, that's the first part about computing. I don't have a lot of time left. So I think what I'll do is I'll just state the properties, which is part B. And these are fairly straightforward. And these are things you have to know. I learn, as it were. So the determinant of AB is the determinant of A times the determinant of B. That's quite a nice fact. And by the way, is not true for traces. <laughs> None of these things are true for trace. Don't get confused about that. These are properties. Debt, not trace. Of course, when we learnt debt, we had some interesting rate for this that came up as later on, so I'm urging you not to get the two confused. Uh, along the same lines, the determinant of a to the m is equal to the determinant of a to the power of m. That follows directly from the first one by induction. And that's pretty nice, and it comes up all the time. The determinant of A inverse, if it exists, is 1 over the determinant of A. That's what I was just quoting over here. By the way, if A inverse doesn't exist, the determinant is 0. So neither side makes sense. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, no, no. This is totally following from, the, from this, absolutely. If A inverse exists, debt A times debt A inverse is the determinant of A times A inverse, which is the determinant of the identity, which is 1. 
Yeah, yeah. All th these two follow directly from this. But they're worth stating. Now, here's one that doesn't quite follow directly from it. The determinant of A transpose equals the determinant of A. That follows from the fact that you can expand along columns or rows. Or it's equivalent to that statement, however you want to look at it. Okay, the determinant of K times a matrix is not actually K times the determinant of A. It's K to the N times the determinant of A. So you might be saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. I thought if you multiply a row by K, you multiply the determinant by K. But of course, KA means that you change every matrix. You multiply every element of the matrix, rather, by K. So actually, you're multiplying every row by K. <laughs> multiply, or in KA, multiply every row by k, and there are n rows. So each row gives you a factor of k. So just beware of that. I, that's a, I've seen this, you know, they'll say, oh, what's the determinant of 3a or something like that. It, it's not just 3 times the determinant of a. It's 3 to the power of whatever the size of the matrix is, n by n, 3 to the n. Uh, determinant of a is equal to the product of the eigenvalues of A, including the complex ones. And we didn't actually state that in chapter six, of course, when we did determinants, because we hadn't done eigenvalues. But I'm, I'm a bit lazy, I don't write eigenvalues, I write evals, but you'll just have to expand and this. Itself. And the last fact is if A is similar to B, then the determinant of A equals the determinant of B. But we will be talking next time about the consequences of similar matrices. I'm sort of saving the full details for later. All right. C is going to be significance of the determinant in terms of volumes in particular. But this will be next time, followed by all of the stuff about eigenvalues. So next time meaning tomorrow night, different place, fine, no, Frist, 302.